Living for generations under the boots of czars and dictators, Russian novelists discovered that they had a compelling story to tell, a story about suffering and the human condition. Here to talk to us about why these stories still matter is Professor Gary Saul Morrison. Professor Morrison and Suffering in Russian Literature on the Evangelization and Culture podcast now. My name is Todd Warner, and this is the Evangelization and Culture podcast from Word on Fire. Gary Saul Morrison is a Lawrence B. Dumas Professor of the Arts and Humanities and Professor of Slavic Languages and Literatures at Northwestern University. He teaches undergraduate courses on the novels of Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and graduate courses on single Russian novels like Anna Karenina, War and Peace, The Brothers Karamazov, and The Idiot. Beyond literary theory, Gary has a keen understanding of ideology and human nature and has written brilliantly on the minds of ideologues and dissidents. Gary is the author of numerous books, including the forthcoming Wonder Confronts Certainty, Russian Writers on the Timeless Questions and Why Their Answers Matter, and has written for countless newspapers and periodicals, including the Wall Street Journal, the New York Review of Books, the New Criterion, Commentary, First Things, and our very own Evangelization and Culture. Professor Gary Saul Morrison, welcome. Thank you for having me. Segment one, Origins. In a collection of essays exploring the mind of Russian philosophy and literary critic Mikhail Bakhtin, Gary, you wrote the following. The quote, great perhaps, end quote. Rabelais' words evoke the central value of Mikhail Bakhtin's life and work, openness to potential for surprise. In commenting about language or literature, history or psychology, Bakhtin continually sought and found unexpected ways to show that people never utter a final word only a penultimate one. Humanity is defined by its unfinalizedness. So Gary, how did you fall in love with Russian literature and what role did the great perhaps and humanity's unfinalizedness play in it? I fell into study of Russian literature by accident. I was going to be a physicist at one point and back in, back in those days, um, People had the idea that you had to know Russian to be a physicist. This was after the launch of Sputnik, and you know, they seemed to dominate science. They didn't, but they seemed to. I, so I took Russian then. And when my interest changed to um, first philosophy, I discovered that's what I really cared about in physics was the view of the world. And then the history of ideas, and finally to how people live ideas, how it matters in their lives, which is what great novels are about. And the greatest novels about that happen to be Russian. And I could already read Russian, so I kind of fell into it by accident. Now, your other, your other question was, remind me. Uh, you know, what role did, did, I think Rabelais was talking about the great perhaps and about unfinalizedness and how, you know, how, do, how does that notion that the exploration of Russian literature oftentimes deals with, uh, ta- uh, refers to final answers, but sometimes doesn't always arrive at them. Uh, h- how much did that have an impact on your attraction to Russian literature? Oh, that, that's, that's a great question. It, it's everything about my attraction to Russian literature. Because the central argument of the Russian tradition for the past 200 years has concerned whether we can and do know the answer to all the fundamental questions of life, of science even, um, ideologues, and among them the Bolsheviks maintained, they had the answer to everything. Or whether we live in a world that is, we can know some things, but it's fundamentally too mysterious or perhaps too complex for us really to understand final answers. And what we do is we deepen our understanding by working harder and examining more. We go further, but we never reach a final answer. The debate in Russia has been between those two schools of thought. You could think of it as the political ideologues on the one hand and the great writers on the other. <clears throat> That's a little too simple, but it's the basic story. When the ideologues take over in the Soviet period, then the novelists who see things differently become dissidents. They write for the drawer. They can't be published in their lifetimes, but they're still producing amazingly great works. <laughs> Um, in the 20th century. So the story continues. And somehow I think that is one of the central stories of the world over the past number of years. People who think they have all the answers and therefore are entitled to be intolerant of others and just suppress them. That's one 
impulse in human nature, and we've seen a lot of it. And those who know that to think you have the final answers can only take place if you are excluding counter evidence and deceiving yourselves because it's pleasant to think you have the final answer. And you know, Russia stands as an example of what happens when you think you've got the final answers, the Soviet period, and we have a lot to learn from it. And the great writers understood this both before and after the revolution. And we have a great deal to learn from them about the human condition. If you conceive of it as fundamentally mysterious, and there's something we always never know about being human, but we have, even though we are better off knowing more than less. You know, and on that note, it's so well said. It seems that there are some people that that recognize that we will never know, and it it draws them forward in great wonder and curiosity. And there's others that live with great degrees of frustration with that, and and they they, they want to seize that that um, unknowing and control it, craft it, mold it to their own purposes. Um, it seems that that may be where the divergence between those who who um, struggle for ideological control and those who who surrender to the unknown of the world kind of separate. Is, is that fair to say? Yes, yes, I think so. I mean, you know, some of it comes with um, our understanding of what, what science is. When I was interested in physics, what fascinated me was there will always be more to learn about the world. And science is a wonderful way of doing it. And, you know, in science, you don't prove something by suppressing counter evidence, telling other people they can't speak. You know, you have to do an experiment and see how it actually works. Suppressing won't won't do it, but other people I, in recent years, I you know, you see people using the word the word science to simply shut down discussion. If you don't believe me, you're anti-science. When in fact, m- much of what is being claimed is not not science at all. It's pseudoscience, and very often is a misunderstanding of how some, you know science works. Usually, is it's sort of like you know the 14th century, I suppose, if you wanted to claim no one can challenge your beliefs, you claim to have a direct revelation from God. Now you claim to be speaking in the name of science. In other words, very even for scientists to do this, scientists can speak pseudoscience. When they're not talking about their own specific discipline or their own discoveries, they very often mistake their philosophy, which they think the science implies, for the science itself. And it never is the same thing. You know, it's interesting because as a, as a practicing physician, I can tell you that one thing we never quite uh, exorcise from the, the practice of our craft is the human condition. So every study that's being done brings with it um, biases and foibles and and assumptions and presumptions and so on and so forth. Uh, so so I, so all of us when we're doing our journal club and looking at the the you know, the randomized, double blind, placebo controlled trials with hard endpoints, um, we have to look at them and say where is where are the confounding variables in here? Where is the human condition in here? And um, you 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 put your finger on that, and it seems like science is a wonderful tool. It's just it's a lousy it's a lousy god. It's a lousy ideology, and it definitely definitely um, has its own fallibility. Yes, and you know, the Soviets claim that their ideology was scientific. They called it scientific socialism. And they meant it very seriously so that, for example, if relativity or quantum theory or genetics, all of which at some point or other seem to contradict official ideology, Marxism, Leninism, as they called it, then it was the genetics and the quantum theory that had to go. They had to be wrong. And the reasoning was it was was the world has a process built into it, into the very nature of matter. And that process led to evolution, and evolution led to historical development through societies as a strict deterministic scientific process, ultimately leads deterministically to communism, with the Communist Party being the voice of that process, which means the Communist Party is the voice of nature itself. And therefore, it cannot be wrong. They don't think of themselves as, you know, human beings deciding on things. They thought of themselves, if you're talking about the Politburo, as the voice of the universe, of nature itself, history. And therefore, physics contradicted it. Physics had to be, physics had to be wrong. That's the, that's the degree of certainty they claim. And of course, all this is pseudoscience. Um, and if you, you know, they thought of science, and many people who speak of science, they think of it as a body of fixed dogma. The whole point of science is that it's never fixed. It's always changing. You know, I guess, you know, certain religious dogmas might be fixed, but the nature of science is different, right? It's always changing, right? There are frontiers where things are more, recent knowledge is less certain and therefore more subject to change and things in the interior, which could, I suppose, change the way Newton's laws eventually did. 
But one of the signs, you know, someone who doesn't understand science is they treat it all as equally certain, an equally certain block of dogma. So that the latest discoveries are as certain as, you know, that, that's a sheer sign you're dealing with, this, with someone who's speaking pseudoscience. A segment two, suffering in Russian literature. In a recent essay for the new criterion on Russian writer Sevalod Gershin, you quoted philosopher Peter Lavrov saying, quote, mankind has paid dearly so that a few intellectuals sitting in their studies could discuss its progress, end quote. Uh, Professor Morrison, what does Peter Lavrov mean when he says this? Peter Lavrov, actually, pronounced it, is, um, was the leading philosopher of what was called the populist school at the time. And the central idea of this group of people was that culture itself, not the particular type of culture, as you know, Fran the Frenchmen always debate about this view of culture or that view of culture, but in Russia, where they tend to take things to the extreme, it was culture and civilization itself, which were morally questionable, regardless of how they were constructed. And so the question was, if the life of the mind, of intellectuals, of art, of science, depends on exploiting the labor of peasants, as was mm. most of the Russian population at the time, then it is immoral itself. You know, it is itself morally questionable. That's kind of what he meant by it. And you see in the, you know, the tendency, you know, of Russian culture to take all questions to their extreme point, which is, you know, has a plus and a minus to it. You know, the, the um, minus is it leads to extreme ideologies of, of politics, right, well, as, in, as in communism. But the plus is that it allows you to see the implications of certain positions in a way that, you know, in England you don't see them because they don't, they don't take, if it goes, goes too far, it's just not common sense. It's not polite in England. You know, there's a passage I love in um, George Eliot's novel, Middle March, where, you know, the narrator says, but, you know, it's one of the good things about human beings in England that no matter what radical ideas they may profess, they never push it so far that it interferes with their dinner. In Russia, that's not true. <laughs> that's right. Their dinner has definitely been upended in Russia plenty of times. And it's and it's funny because uh, you know Ch I think it's Cheshire that talks about the notion of progress that that we and and, and Lavrov. Thank you for correcting my pronunciation of, of him. Um, <clears throat> Chester, I think, refers to the notion that progress needs to have be, needs to rely on a cast iron set of uh, kind of a creed from which you are springing. You know, what does progress mean? You need to have a, 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 a an origin and a destination. Progress in and of itself is is just saying movement. And and it's interesting that, that again, in some of these utopian I, I, uh, ideologies or these utopian societies, um, you can progress towards hell. Uh, you can you can you can you can progress towards the gulag, pro progress towards the concentration camp, and so on. So um, it's it, it's it's fascinating to think and how innocuous it might be to have effectively uh, intellectuals dining, sharing drinks, and and designing horrible ideas that are going to affect massive amounts of people. So it's it's a fascinating topic. And you've written on this so well in so many different venues. Uh, one question I want to ask you, uh, uh, Gary, is this. So you've been a friend and a contributor at Word on Fire for several years now. And in our spring issue of Evangelization and Culture, you begin your essay, Suffering in Russian Literature, with a quote from Svetlana Alexievich, who who is accepting the the Nobel Prize for Literature now? Now Svetlana Alexievich is Ukrainian by birth. She resided in Belarus, where for years she wrote critically about the Soviet Union. And she noted, "quote Suffering is our capital, our national resource. Not oil or gas, but suffering. It is the only thing we are able to produce consistently. But great books are piled at our feet." So I want to ask you, what is it about Russian literature or Eastern European literature that so keenly understands suffering? Yeah, it's really interesting. I'm not quite sure why that's the case, but it's a central feature of the great Russian writers to explore this. She was really speaking, you know, for the whole tradition, you know, when she said that. And sure. the we here, by the way, you mentioned she's, you know, half Ukrainian and half yellow Russian, but the we here refers to her as a member of the Russian literary tradition. She's not Russian, but she belongs to Russian literature, and that's how she's sure. identified. Probably nobody understood, you know, suffering as a psychological phenomenon better than Dostoevsky. That's his, yeah. and different kinds of, not, he, and not just physical suffering. I mean, it was really moral or psychological suffering that was his, was his interest. Um, you know, he has an he has an early novel called The Insulted and the Humiliated. He understood so well the feeling of being utterly humiliated, yeah. being regarded as nothing or less nothing that feeling you know or the on the other hand the feeling of wanting to 
of feeling you are the superior people of the universe, and therefore you get to tell other people you know, what to do. Those kinds of ways in which your sense of self yeah. affects your view of the world and your ideas. That, that's his you know, central theme as, as a novelist of ideals. I mean, he, he began his career with an early novella called Poor People, and it was not a study of poverty as a sociologist or an economist would have done it. What he was interested in was the way in which poverty deforms the personality. Mm. So that you begin to internalize the denigrating view of yourself that others have and treat yourself that way from within. You know, other writers treated you know, poor people is just as proud and <clears throat> assertive as everybody else. They just didn't have any money. And, how, <clears throat> and then if you just gave them money, <clears throat> they'd be fine. But once the personality is deformed that way, you see, this is what he, internally, it becomes <clears throat> much harder to figure out what to do. Um, and that, you know, he was the first really to really get that, right? Yeah. One of the central themes. In the Soviet period, you develop forms of suffering that really have, had never existed before. Mm -hmm. I mean, you take millions of people, some of them, let's say, highly educated. You spend 20 years training a, a doctor or a physicist, and then you arrest him and you send him out first in, to Siberia in a sealed box car, unheated in winter, unventilated in mm -hmm. summer, where there's so many people that you can't sit down. You can only stand up. You feed them salted herring and you don't give them water. So by the time they reach Eastern Siberia, you know, that's eight time zones away, let's say. You can open the compartment and nobody's alive. Yeah, yeah. If people are alive, yeah. then you send them to the frozen north to be, and by frozen, I mean where temperatures go down to 60 or 70 degrees below zero. Yeah. That's what I mean by frozen, right? Yeah. You know, the coldest spots on Earth outside of central Antarctica to, you know, dig for gold, utterly frozen ground, right? And, where they, and you don't give them sufficient calories to live, and most of them die. Your sense, uh, the best stories you see of people who survived this, um, a writer named Varlam Shalamov, wonderful stories here, where what he's describing is how your sense of yourself as a human being gradually shrinks away. Mm. And you discuss the kind of emotions that you're capable of that you lose. And he has one wonderful story where, you know, this actually happened to him. He was near death. And for, you know, he started out as 200 pounds, but at this point he was 90 pounds. He was transferred at the last minute to a place where he could work indoors and be warm and get fed. And gradually over the months, his health became better and he acquired, um, he put on weight, began to think more, and he noticed which emotions came back first. This was a kind of anthropology that, that no anthropologist in the South Seas yeah, yeah. Had ever come across. It's right. a way of exploring the essence of the human being through its suffering, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, th those stories you described, which emotions come, uh, you know, back first, and, you know, it certainly isn't love, he said, it comes a lot later, you know. Yeah, you know, it's, and I'll tell you, so one of my engagements with medical students is bringing them Dostoevsky and, and other great writers, and I, I was talking to one of the uh, advisors of these medical students who was wondering why are we why am I teaching Dostoevsky to medical students, and I was speaking about the notion of the suffering of Raskolnikov or or some of the figures from Brothers Karamazov and how it can be in Russian it can be a hundred years or beyond a hundred years uh, distance in time it can be a different culture different language and yet that suffering is so so acutely described and so profoundly nuanced in terms of the way our our souls work even in the modern era that that it's endlessly relevant and yet the person kind of looked at me sort of perplexed that well how could this be endlessly relevant this is a different time and it's it, that that's the thing i think you're putting your finger on is the nuances of what dostoevsky d had to say about the human soul um it, it transcends time place and culture and and that's why to some extent and we're going to move into our next section in a second but that's why it's important to be teaching this in, in the modern era i i wanted to ask you this because you've spoken about um these these authors like dostoevsky putting their fingers on human nature so so you've written um that in and i want to see am i pronouncing is it mikhail is it Bakhtin, is that correct? Bakhtin. Bakhtin. You've written that in Mikhail Bakhtin's view, uh, and I think Bakhtin is one of Russia's greatest literary theorists, um, quote, your quote, tragedy in its pure form, the kind created in antiquity 
by the likes of Aeschylus, Sophocles, and even Euripides is in fact naive, quite naive. They didn't come in contact with the abyss. They weren't really familiar with actual terror, didn't know it yet. They were, despite their incredible power and stature, children. And then, if I may, in his Gulag Archipelago, Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, and you know this and know this well, and many readers of the Gulag Archipelago know it as well because it sends shivers down everybody's spine, quote, if the intellectuals in the plays of Chekhov who spent all their time guessing what would happen in 20, 30, or 40 years, had been told that in 40 years, interrogation by torture would be practiced in Russia, that prisoners would have their skulls squeezed with iron rings, that a human being would be lowered into an acid bath. And he gives various and sundry terrible, terrible tortures. And he concludes, if if the writers of an earlier age um, had known this is what was going to happen, not one of Chekhov's plays would have gotten to its end. I mean, if they would have written like this, not one of Chekhov's plays would have gotten to its end because all the heroes would have gone off to insane asylums, end quote. So considering Solzhenitsyn's assertion, were your, we, we just talked about the nuanced insight into the human soul of Dostoevsky, and I would presume you'd say the same about Chekhov and Tolstoy and others. Um, Solzhenitsyn seemed to be calling them a little bit naive. What's your sense about how well they apprehended uh, uh, the, the, the depravity that human soul is capable of and how much is Solzhenitsyn right that they were, in fact, naive. Bakhtin's comment was made in an interview just shortly before he died, <laughs> you know, he was just talk, talking to people. And when, when he, he was a classical scholar you know, by training, he studied the Greek and Latin classics. And so when he spoke about, you know, Aeschylus and Soph Sophocles being naive, he meant that the kind of evil they had encountered did not measure up to what 20th century Palestinians produced. Sure. You couldn't hardly expect them to. You could hardly any. No, there's only one person who, before the Bolshevik Revolution, let's say, guessed what horror was capable. It's Dostoevsky who describes it in detail in one of his novels, right? And, but he had the, the, probably the, you know, as profound a sense of evil and what people are capable of, of anybody. Yeah. So there's certainly no naive. When he describes this stuff, people thought he was crazy. <laughs> Nothing could ever. And, and if you look at it from their perspective, things have been getting more and more humane in Europe over the century. It certainly seemed crazy. But he focused on the Russian intelligentsia and the way they thought, their smug certainty about everything. And they're willing to take things to extremes, as intellect, only intellectuals really will do. And he just asked himself, what would these people do? Mm ever actually had power. Right. Right. And they described what they would do. And it turned out to be okay. What he described, if it didn't happen in Soviet Russia, it happened in Maoist China yeah, or yeah. you know, or in um, Cambodia under the Khmer Rouge. <laughs> but nobody had those because he had this sense of evil and another way suffering figures in human nature is the desire to inflict mm -hmm. you know, not to achieve some goal, but as an end in itself. Yeah. The joy of domination and absolute mm. power is, is also a part of human nature, right? I mean, I, I suppose some of it you could, some of these ideas you could find in the Marquis de Sade, writing mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. I forget the word, sadism. And Dostoevsky knew the writings of the Marquis de Sade. Yeah, well, yeah. He was quite impressed by them. Um, but otherwise, you don't get that sense of what people are capable, you know, capable of, you know, as we see, we saw in you know, the Third Reich, Maoist China, and <clears throat> Khmer Rouge, so the, in, in the 20th century, right? um, you know, if one can remain an optimist and believe in the essential goodness of human nature after the 20th century, I don't know what, what evidence would yeah. change your mind at all. <laughs> you know, and, and I do have friends who, you know, who, who you know, who believe in the essential goodness of human nature, yeah. you know, or I have a friend who just, you know, believes in it because he says he believes in a providential God and therefore things have to be good. But you look at the fat, and, you know, to which I was, I don't know, I, I don't know the mind of God, but I yeah. do know what people are capable of. Right. 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 Yeah, um, well said. I want to ask too, because I know a lot of people are going to want to read this. Um, was it The Possessed? Is that the book that you're referring to that Dostoevsky really kind of explores this? Yes, it is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. And, and I also know that you have a big, I, I, I've taken your recommendations over the years. Uh, is, is it Constance, is it Garnett or Garrett? Constance? Garnett. Constance. Garnett. If, if you're going to, if you're recommend editions of Dostoevsky's works um, and I think Tolstoy's and others, it's Constance uh, Garnett. Is that, is that fair to say? For most, most of them, it's either Garnett herself 
or somebody has done some light revisions of Garnett. Sure. Um, those are usually the best of almost, you know, of Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, with the um, exception of War and Peace, you know, mm -hmm. Tolstoy, where the best version is by um, Anne Dunnigan. It's okay. out of it's out of print at the moment. You can get it used um, or on Kindle, um, and it's a truly superior, you know, translation. You know, I have a list of my favorite translations of all the classics. So, you know, people write to me sometimes, "What should I read?" And I, I just send them, you know, <laughs> send them <clears throat> this list. Um, it, it vary, you know. Garnett is almost always a, a good choice. She's not always the best choice. Sure, sure. Hi, I'm Todd Warner, Managing Editor of Evangelization and Culture, the Journal of the Word on Fire Institute. Word on Fire is a global evangelical community that exists to provide our members with the resources they need to proclaim Christ to a secular culture. Our award-winning quarterly journal, Evangelization and Culture, is offered exclusively to Word on Fire Institute members. It's a tangible representation of our mission and goal to lead with beauty in order to bring others to the knowledge of truth. Inside each issue, you'll find writing from premier scholars and inspiring pieces on literature, culture, and daily life from fellow missionaries on the journey to know and serve Christ. Get a copy of the current issue of the Evangelization and Culture Journal for free by visiting wordonfire.org journal. Thank you and join us in bringing Christ to a hungry culture. Segment three, teaching Russian literature. In the introduction to your probing work, Anna Karenina, in our time, you observe, quote, history needs to immerse itself in the perspective of the past if it is to be historical at all. But we tend to be interested in the past for a reason. Who are we and how do we get here? Did we make a mistake and could we correct it or at least not repeat it? So Gary, what has Russian literature taught you about human nature, about who we are and how we got here? Oh wow! <clears throat> I don't know where to begin to answer, <laughs> you know, answer a question like that. You know, the, the book I did is about all the, the big questions about you know life and human nature that appear in Russian literature, and there are many, there are many of them. Well, one thing we haven't talked about yet is an idea that Russians like to explore, you know, especially in the 19th and early 20th centuries, um, but not only that, was the question of how we should understand our lives. Should we understand it in terms of, as people usually do, and as stories usually do, in terms of the big dramatic events that make a good story? Mm. Or does the essence of life lie in ordinary moments, the smallest movements of consciousness, the everyday that nobody bothers to record simply because it's so ordinary? Yeah. But in, that's where the essence lies. And what happens is, you know, the unusual moments, which we remember only because they're unusual and so assume are important, what happens at those moments is largely the product of what's already done at, at the 100 million ordinary moments. That's a question that Russians are talking about. Know, is it the big or the small? And, you know, the, Tolstoy was the great proponent of the idea of what he called the tiny, tiny alterations of consciousness, which he was an expert at describing. Yeah. The value of ordinary, everyday, undramatic caring and goodness. The danger of all romantic views, you know, the high drama of life. You know, whether you conceive of love that way or history or politics, those are always da dangerous. And you have to really understand life in the ordinary, right? in the prosaic. Yeah. Um, you know, his Chekhov, who deeply admired Tolstoy, and knew him very well, um, picked that up. And in his stories and plays, he's probably the best short story writer mm. lived. In his story, that he shows how that works out. Yeah, you know, really, really brilliant. And if they are right, or to the extent they're right, we need to learn to pay attention to the things we usually overlook. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that's one of the, I think, you know. The lessons you can get from the Russian tradition. You know, and, and when you, I, you, it always reminds me of what you've written that I loved. Uh, I think it was Tolstoy talking about, is it Brilyev? Uh, Brilyev, the artist? Yeah, yeah. Brilyev. And, who, who, who went and altered someone's painting just a brushstroke or two, and, and the student effectively says, you know, you made a, such a minor change, but it, in fact, you've transformed it. And he says, art is where the little bit begins, or something to that effect. Um, yeah, the student says, you only changed it a tiny, tiny bit, or 
Hashem. You only barely, barely changed it, right? And um, Bulov replies, art begins where that tiny bit begins. Amen. And then Tolstoy says, that saying is strikingly true, not only of art, but of all of life. True life is lived not where great dramatic changes take place, but where the tiny, tiniest alterations of consciousness are going on. And, and, this, and this speaks a little bit to the sensibility of what this podcast is dedicated to, is the notion of, of being intentional in our daily lives, spiritually and otherwise. And I think so many times people are, are assessing the, the status of their lives based on their resume as opposed to their eulogy and what they anticipate or hope their eulogy would be. And again, the eulogy is dominated by notions that are the small presences, um, the kindnesses, the acts of grace, as opposed to uh, this job change, this catastrophe, et cetera. Um, reading Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and others based on your recommendations over time and your your uh, your your discussions of them in your in your essays has helped me to really identify just how much they are in touch with the little bit that goes into living and i think it's it's absolutely profound it's absolutely profound i wanted to, i wanted to ask you uh, when, when you're teaching students now i know that you, your class is one of the most popular classes at northwestern it's been it's been just you, you've been award winning and people really really have just enjoyed all that you had to teach but you're teaching russian literature and that's not necessarily the, the the beginning of a selling point for many of the modern world what are you doing how are you expressing this uh, or teaching this to students to get them engaged in why this matters in the modern age? I think, I, I don't really know what I'm doing that work, so I just keep doing it. But, <laughs> I, you know, um, but if I had to, to guess, I, I would say two things which are really important and I would recommend for, you know, any literature teacher. Um, one is you have to teach students, and not just teach them, but show them why Great literature is worth reading. You know, the way they've usually been taught, high school and increasingly in college as well, the way they've been taught literature, it's a good reason they don't want to read it because no sensible person would read it the way if all they had to offer was what it's taught. You know, right. you know um, sometimes it's taught as, okay, here's a lot of technical things. Let's find symbols. Who cares, right? Or it can be taught as, um, we are so much smarter than that Shakespeare guy. Let's show where he went. What a but if you begin by presuming everything you know can't be questioned, right. then what's the point of reading somebody? Right. Right? right. And sometimes they do it in a documentary way. This shows what working class conditions were in England. If you read Dickens, and it's true, it does. But that's not what makes it really important. That's right. So I just assume they don't know this and try to bring it out by you know I read passages expressively and try to show why they're why they're profound and what they have to learn for now. You can do this with any any literature. Russian literature is ex particularly explicit about raising questions that concern everybody. Like, you know, Anna Karenina is about the nature of love and how you should understand love if you're going to live a rich and happy life. Mm -hmm. No student who doesn't care about that. Yeah, right? exactly, exactly. You know, others are about how you look at your life as a whole. And what makes it mean? What makes a meaningful life? <laughs> they care about, about that too. Um, you know, you, a lot of these questions are asked, you know, in other literatures, but usually not as explicitly. There are a few exceptions. So, and the exceptions I also like to teach, you know, in, yeah. you know, say in English literature. But let's say, you know, if you read, you know, a, a novelist I particularly love, Jane Austen, these questions are all there, but they're not explicit. You have to sort of tease them out. Okay? It's like, you know, in England and France, to make those questions too explicit is kind of impolite. You know? Yeah. Right. But not in, not in Russian, right? I mean, Russians pride themselves. Even characters in Dostoevsky even talk about this. What makes us Russians is that we sit around and talk about the timeless questions. Mm. Two people who meet in a train carriage who have never seen each other before, will never meet again. And what do they talk about? You know, the meaning of life, yeah, <clears throat> and they, yeah. you know, and Russian literature is filled, filled with these discussions. The prosaic, the little bits. Well, on some of these questions, yeah, uh, these questions are not prosaic. Some yeah, prosaic. the questions are prosaic, but they're in prosaic circumstances, I should that's say. Right, ordinary circumstances. They just, you know, do it. And that, that's sort of characteristic of Russian literature. So I find it particularly 
you know, easy or, or ready to, the material <clears throat> adapts itself to making itself interesting to students. Um, but, you know, you should be able to do that, all great works of literature. That's how you show why they're great. You know, if you can't make um, Shakespeare or Dick <clears throat> or George Eliot interesting, yeah. there's something wrong. Yeah, with yeah, it. yeah. But there's a lot of professors that are capable of making it uninteresting. So it takes a very talented one like you to be doing what you're doing and to 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 revive that 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 uh, fire within it. It's it's fantastic. Well, I'm just sort of you know going against the grain, <laughs> doing what I think is how I've always been. You know, life is too short. And if you're doing what everybody else is doing, it's probably because everybody else is doing it. In which case, you're wasting your time. <laughs> Well said. I do want to commend everybody. Um, your the the essay I probably share with my students more often than others. Uh, why college kids are avoiding the study of literature, uh, which is wonderful, and talks about what's happened to literature. And you said very well, and this really applies to us in the clinical world. If psychologists, sociologists, or economists understood people as well as George Eliot or Tolstoy did, they could create portraits of people as believable as Middlemarch's Dorothea Brooke or Anna Karenina, but no social scientist has ever come close. And the point also is in reading great literature, you empathize. And it's a wonderful, wonderful dissertation on the value of literature. Segment four, uh, The Way Forward. Um, Gary, as you concluded your work, Hidden in Plain View, Narrative and Creative Potentials of War and Peace, you mused, quote, perhaps we might teach ourselves step by small step, to see in a new way what we have always regarded as too ordinary or unremarkable to attend. The light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. So, Gary, what is the light that comes out of the darkness that we find in Russian literature? You know, it's a, more than anything, I would say it's a way of paying attention to the world around us. To pay attention to Everything that makes it mysterious and more complex than you're likely to think, and paying attention to things that you would normally overlook, like how your mind works, the stray thoughts you're not what you're focusing on, but what you're not focusing on, mm -hmm. you know, how that affects you, the ways in which you know every day we teach ourselves to overlook what we don't want to see or deceive ourselves in one way, um, if we could learn to pay attention to all all those things, we would understand life more deeply. I think that's what, what the Russian, great Russian writers are, are telling us. We block it out. We don't want to see it. You know, as Tolstoy would say, we put a curtain up between us and Very good. We don't want to, you know, face the implications of our own mortality or our own moral responsibility. For, it's unpleasant to do so. But really, it, you know, if you want to really understand life, if you value life, you want to, you know, seize it by the throat because it's yeah. the only hope you've got. You have to learn how to change the way you pay attention. Well said. Well said. Um, a couple of questions. With your book coming out, Wonder Confronts Certainty, Russian Writers on the Timeless Questions and Why Their Answers Matter. Um, I, I know you have a lot more great thinking and writing ahead, but I know this is absolutely in your wheelhouse. Is this, I, I hate to say it, would you consider this book to be your magnum opus or are there, uh, is there a magnum opus yet to come? I, I know a writer never, never wants to say this is the one, but this feels like this could be the one among many, many wonderful works. What, what are your thoughts on this? Well, it's certainly the biggest book I ever wrote. And the most comprehensive. It wasn't my idea originally. Um, an editor from Harvard University Press, uh, who's now moved on, but a wonderful editor, John Coulter, came to me once and said, I know the book you were born to write. Mm. And he outlined more or less what this book, you know, turned out to be. And, you know, and then we want, you know, a big book, two or three times the size of a normal book. They've been publishing several of those, you know. Which are done quite well, and um, and I said, but you know, to do this, I would have to learn periods of Russian thought which are not my specialty. Mm -hmm. I thought the nineteenth century. I have to really learn the twentieth century. Um, and he said, okay, we'll take ten years. <clears throat> and I was right here. Wrote me a contract for I forget how many years. <clears throat> Long in the future. And so, over those years, I kept working towards this. You know, mm -hmm. if I someone asked me to write an article on something, I would say. Yeah, I'll pick that. That's a 20th century writer. I'll do that. You know, 
Um, and over, you know, it took me a very long time. So in that sense, the magnum opus, because it took me longer. I had mm. to read more. I had to learn more. And then I had to synthesize everything. <clears throat> um, um, you know, so I, ho- I hope I still do something else that's, <clears throat> that's you know, that's So really- do we. So to all of us who are reading you over and over again. So, no, we're thrilled about it. We want you to keep producing. I want you to add, also, as we wind down here or, or end here, um, what do you recommend those who are un, uh, unfamiliar or untraveled in Russian literature? A couple of books you'd say these are, these are uh, you can't, can't be missed. I know, I know the canon, but just from your mouth, it'll make more of an impression to people. What, what are the two or three that everybody should read? Oh, that's a good question. Well, um, you know, from the, the classic period, I would say read um, the Brothers Karamazov and Anna Karenina. Mm-hmm. And from, you know, the, the 20th century, it's hard, I would say, um, a wonderful book by Mikhail Bulgakov, The Master and Margarita, mm. and uh, Vasily Grossman's book, Life and Fate. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're all deep. And brilliant. They're all capable of changing the way you see the world. They changed mine each time I read one. Wonderful. Wonderful. Last question, because my daughter asked me to ask you this. Of all the books you've written, which is your favorite? Well, that's a good question. Um, I guess the one I, I'm proud of stuff for its content is the one called Narrative and Freedom. Mm. And the one I'm, I think is the, the best written and the most amusing is um, one called The Words of Others, which is mm. not about Russian literature at all. It's about how we use famous quotations and what role they play in shaping culture. You know, famous last words, mm. great misses, mm. you, know, um, you know, epitaphs, <clears throat> things, you know, famous statements like, you know, I have nothing to offer but blood, sweat, and tears. Yeah, you know, yeah. how, well, how will those things shape our consciousness? And it, I, I, I think I conveyed that. My writing was particularly good at conveying what makes makes that interesting and it's fun so it's, but it's not good with russian literature that's wonderful I that's just wonderful like- well professor gary saul morrison professor writer and sage in an uncertain age thank you so much for taking the time i i really hope to bring you back again and again it's always a pleasure to catch up with you but this is our our first official visit together so it's an honor and a pleasure thank you thanks for asking such wonderful questions and for having me Well, that was a great conversation to be having with Gary Saul Morrison on uh, suffering and literature. I want to offer you a reflection. Dostoevsky and Chekhov, Tolstoy and Turgenev, these names all sound so unbearably heavy and impossibly distant. They evoke images of fevered, bearded men in rags, hirsute Orthodox priests in monasteries, and metal-bedecked chesty generals in snow-filled valleys. The imposing names of Rodion Raskalnikov and Anna Karenina, Natasha Rostov and Alyosha Karamazov are, are only outpaced by the mysterious depths of their characters. Their lives and trials deal with little more than, well, everything. What is the value of one life? What is the meaning of love? What does true femininity look like? Where is God in a world filled with evil? In carriages and hovels, military outposts and train stations, the Russian literary greats find the prosaic shot through with the profound, the darkness pierced through by light everlasting. The demand that we reckon not only with their trials and conundrums, but with ourselves. To borrow Lionel Trilling's verdict on the seemingly harmless, avuncular poet Robert Frost, the Russian novelists are terrifying. But why? Well, because they paint a portrait as we are, instead of airbrushing us as we would like to be. Like the creations of William Shakespeare and Charles Dickens, Jane Austen and Dante Alighieri, we see ourselves in the garish light of day. Beneath our self-protecting, self-absolving layers reside the the shifter and the shuffler, the coward and the snob. But this revelation is never meant to invite a hopeless nihilism. Nihilism is drenched in meaninglessness, and the Russian novelists write exclusively because our lives are so very meaningful. In fact, our lives are so meaningful that Dostoevsky commands an utter fidelity to truth. As you might recall in the Brothers Karamazov, Father Zosima says, quote, Above all, don't lie to yourself. The man who lies to himself and listens to his own lie comes to such a point that he cannot distinguish the truth within him or around him, and so loses respect for himself and others. 
And, ha and having no respect, he ceases to love. And in order to distract himself without love, he gives, a, he gives way to passions and coarse pleasures and sinks to the bestiality in his vices. All this comes from lying to other men and to himself, end quote. In lying to ourselves, we lose respect for ourselves. In losing respect for ourselves, we lose respect for others. And in losing respect for others, we cease to love. In ceasing to love, we become prey to our worst instincts. The Russian novelists begin with a contested state of man's soul and, and propel us to the embattled territory of human society. And if the Russians have taught us anything, it is that the clever devil drawing out our very souls of perdition is more than pleased, through our brokenness, to drag entire societies into the abyss should the opportunity arise. And so we must read these difficult, confounding, wondrous, illuminating works of Russian literature, if only to know ourselves, to wrestle with our liabilities, and to nurture our virtues. And we must share them with our children and our children's children. The greatest Russian literature may seem from long ago and far away, but its lessons are made keenly manifest here and now. And that, after all, is the thing about human nature. Outside our flagging will and the grace of God, it just doesn't change much. Now, before we go, I'd like to talk to you about uh, a particular read uh, that I'd recommend. In each one of these podcasts, I'd like to end with uh, a quick recommendation. And I think pretty aptly in this uh, particular podcast, I'd like to recommend uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Uh, Crime and Punishment is uh, a, a truly masterful work about uh, a man who commits a crime and tries to, with the help of ideology, convince himself that that crime is okay, that there, there are no victims and, and there's no reason to feel guilty and there's, there's no concern about uh, the ramifications. And, and yet, throughout the rest of the novel, he spends suffering all those things he denied existed. He suffers from the pangs of conscience. He suffers from the fear of discovery. Uh, he suffers from the sense that there are good things that we must do and bad things we must avoid. Uh, Dostoevsky covers the, the range of human nature uh, captured in this one evil act and all of its ramifications uh, in a superb fashion. So check out Crime and Punishment from Fyodor Dostoevsky. It is worth your time. Thank you for listening to the Evangelization and Culture Podcast. Please be sure to subscribe to Word on Fire's YouTube channel, leave a review, and share with your friends. And don't forget to get a free copy of Word on Fire's award-winning journal, Evangelization and Culture at wordonfire.org slash journal. Until next time, I'm Todd Warner. Please keep proclaiming Christ to a hungry culture.